Eclipses of the sun and moon are among nature's grandest spectacles. Ancient people, of course, were terrified when those most important celestial objects unexpectedly disappeared from their skies. But today, the accurate prediction of eclipses enables millions of people to understand, enjoy, and appreciate the interactions of the Earth, the Sun, and the Moon. An eclipse of the Moon, also called a lunar eclipse, always occurs at full moon when the moon becomes directly opposite the sun in the sky so that the moon actually passes into the Earth's shadow. It doesn't happen at every full moon though because the moon's orbit is tipped a little bit and the moon often passes the Earth's shadow to the north or the south. But about twice a year the moon's orbit is positioned just right so the moon enters the Earth's shadow and we have a lunar eclipse. If the moon at full moon were to pass directly into this shadow, the moon would get very much darker as the sunlight was taken away from it. Uh, exactly how dark depends on what part of the shadow the moon goes through. If it, if it goes through dead center on the shadow, the darkest part, the umbra, that would be called a total eclipse of the moon. Uh, if it were to be a little bit higher or lower than the shadow and kind of graze the umbra, partly into it, partly out of it, that's called a partial eclipse. And it's also possible for the moon to not go through the umbra at all, but only through the, the less dark penumbral region surrounding it. That's called a penumbral eclipse. Lunar eclipses take quite a few hours. They're slow, unlike solar eclipses that are over in a few minutes. So you can take your time and you can set up your cameras and you can make hot chocolate and eat cookies and enjoy a, a lunar eclipse that will last quite a number of hours. As the moon moves into the Earth's shadow, the full moon begins to have a dark edge and the dark edge expands and envelops the moon and finally the moon is completely dark. While this is happening during the, the beginning part of it, as the moon gets covered further and further over, uh, the shadow is round, the Earth is round and so the shadow is round and so we see a circular arc like a bite taken out of the full moon which gets deeper and deeper and deeper as the moon moves further into it. At first this shadow looks black. It's so much darker than the bright fully lit full moon that in contrast it looks completely dark. In some lunar eclipses, the moon becomes so dark it's difficult to see against the background of stars. In many lunar eclipses, the moon glows a kind of coppery red. And that red light is actually light from the Earth's atmosphere. You can imagine where that red light comes from if you imagine being on the moon during a lunar eclipse. If you look back toward the Earth, you don't see the sun. You see the entire atmosphere of the Earth illuminated in a sunset all the way around the Earth, a ring of sunset. And the red light from that sunset illuminates the moon and makes it glow a coppery red color. The moon remains in total eclipse for an hour or so, and then it moves along its orbit and continues out of the shadow, and we begin to see it emerge. First part of the moon is illuminated by sunlight, and then more and more. And within an hour or two, the moon is fully out of the shadow and the eclipse is over. As beautiful as a lunar eclipse can be, it pales in comparison to another spectacle of the sky, one we have watched with fear and wonder. We have written records of observations of eclipses that go back to the second millennium BC from China. So we certainly know that people have been looking at eclipses for a very long time and reacting to them. There are a few exceptions to the general conclusion people have drawn throughout the world, but most people have seen an eclipse of the moon or the sun as big trouble. Eclipses were intrusions on the Oh, the concrete reality and orderliness of the universe. And when they occurred, people tried to get rid of them. Our sun is 400 times larger in diameter than the moon, but it's 400 times further away. So when the moon crosses in front of the sun, we have a very spectacular solar eclipse when the moon blots out the bright surface of the sun. Not all solar eclipses are the same. If you happen to be standing in the path of the shadow of the moon, you're in the path of totality and you'll see a total solar eclipse. The moon's shadow sweeps over you and the bright surface of the sun is completely hidden and you see a total eclipse. But if you're outside that path, 
then you see part of the sun peeking around the moon. You're in the penumbra of the moon's shadow. And then you see a partial eclipse. If you got more than a few thousand miles away from that spot, you wouldn't see an eclipse at all. Even though there's an eclipse happening that day, you're sufficiently off-center that, from your point of view, the sun and the moon are not lined up, and the moon doesn't cover the sun at all. Sometimes we have a solar eclipse when the moon is in the further part of its orbit. The moon's orbit is elliptical. And when it's a little bit further away from the Earth, it can be too small to hide the sun. And we see a, a circle of sunlight around the moon. It's an annulus, and we refer to that as an annular eclipse. Annular eclipses are interesting, but they're, they're not very exciting. Total eclipses are the big show. As the eclipse begins, there, there are a number of phenomena that can occur. One of them, for example, is called Bailey's beads. Either at the beginning of the eclipse or at the end of the eclipse, a small portion of the sun's brilliant surface can peek through a valley on the edge of the moon, and suddenly, for just a moment, you may see a brilliant, glowing uh, a string of beads along the edge of the moon. The last one of those beads, and especially if you have a nice deep valley where all the others have gone away, can become this diamond ring. You see a brilliant bit of white light staring at you with the much softer glow, white as well, pearly glow, of the corona surrounding it, and that's called the diamond ring. You get one at the onset of totality and at the end of totality if you're lucky. But there's another beauty in eclipses, and that is in the pattern that they make. Eclipses occur during certain eclipse seasons. They follow a pattern. Eclipses of the sun occur at new moon. Eclipses of the moon occur at full moon. We have one new moon and one full moon every single month, and yet we don't have eclipses every single month. The reason has to do with the fact that as the Earth goes around the sun once a year in its orbit, that orbit remains within a single flat zone, a single plane called the ecliptic plane. And as the moon goes around the Earth once a month, it too occupies a plane which is tilted by about five degrees relative to the Earth's orbit around the sun. Astronomers have recorded and predicted eclipses for centuries. But few of these celestial alignments can match the spectacle and drama of a total solar eclipse. If you can get to an, an eclipse of the sun, do so. You may have to travel thousands of miles to put yourself in the path of totality, but the experience is really worth the effort because a total eclipse of the sun is really a beautiful experience. A total eclipse really starts with an average regular day. Uh, there's nothing unusual about it except that uh, maybe an hour or so before totality, there's a little notch, a bite taken out of the sun. and I at least feel like there's a, I have a moment of relief when, aha, it's happening right on time just the way it's supposed to. And for the next 45 minutes to an hour, um, all that happens is that the sun gets eaten up by the moon. And as time passes, the moon moves further across the sun, and over a period of an hour or two, the moon begins to blot out larger and larger portions of the sun. It's still mostly broad daylight. Your eyes open to adjust to the dimming light, and you don't really notice that, that anything is happening unless you're really paying attention to the sun. Among the things that happens in those last few minutes, uh, the, the lighting gets much darker. It's like a very heavy overcast, except there's no clouds, and so you still have shadows. And the shadows are unusual because the sun isn't symmetrical anymore. It's a long, narrow thing, a crescent rather than a round object. And so if you were to put your hand out and look at the shadow on the ground, you would see it would look fuzzy in certain directions, but it would be very sharp in other directions, depending how you oriented it relative to the crescent sun. And you may even see little crescents on the ground, pinhole projections of the sun. In fact, nature sometimes does the job for us by providing pinhole images through leaves in trees. Many leaves will overlay each other, and sometimes you get a pinhole of light that comes down, projects onto the ground. We all notice that the ants that had been so plentiful during all morning long suddenly disappeared as totality approached. And the cows came home. There was a cow pasture uh, not very far away, and, and all of a sudden they were lined up bumper to bumper heading back to uh, wherever they go at, at sunset. You get this overwhelming feeling because of the, the speed of all this that, that you're about to be engulfed by something that you have no control over. Uh, like you're standing on a track with a freight train coming down and, and your feet are nailed to the track. 
because you're about to be engulfed by the shadow, which you can actually see extending out of the sky. It's rushing toward you at 1,000 miles per hour. Now you can't actually keep track of all that's going on. You can't be looking all the directions that you'd like to be. You might be looking up, trying to see how early you can see the corona. Are there any large prominences visible? You're looking for the diamond ring effect and Bailey's beads before then. And so there, all these things are going on in that last couple of minutes. The real spectacle, of course, comes when the sun is completely covered over. That's the total eclipse, the total phase of the total eclipse. This only lasts for about seven minutes at the longest. The sky gets a very dark blue, it's like a deep twilight. You can actually see the brighter planets and stars during the daytime. The corona is brilliant, pearly white. The corona is not subtle. It, it's actually about as bright as the full moon. It's just that the normal sun is half a million times brighter than that, which is why you don't normally see the corona. And that bright white light is in stark contrast to the silhouette of the moon, which really is black. It's like the blackest black that you'll ever see. There's no reflected light coming from that direction at all. It's like somebody punched a hole in the sky. And I was also surprised and delighted by the prominences that we were hoping to see. And so I was looking at the prominences under magnification, much easier to see then, and, and reminded that they're always there. I mean, they, they look violent. The sun seems to be seething, except it's only during a few minutes of totality that you can actually see this. And then it's all over. In a flash you get a diamond ring again. Maybe you've got some prominences. Again, which direction you're looking matters. It all unreels the other way like a movie going backwards. People return to trying to settle down after a very exciting few minutes and you watch the eclipse end. Finally the sun is back whole and it's like nothing happened. The motions of the Earth and Moon create fantastic spectacles in the sky. An endless parade of events that occur with such regularity, we mark time in their rhythms. Some we see every day. Others we witness only by chance or with great effort. But these patterns provide more than celestial drama. They are cycles of the sky that profoundly affect life on Earth.